So all week, the 235th American Astronomical Society meeting has been happening in Honolulu, Hawaii. Remind me why I didn't sign up for that meeting again. And as with all meetings of this kind, announcements of new results and discoveries have been pouring in and it's like only halfway through as well. So one of my favorites so far from the meeting has been the announcement of a discovery of a giant wave of gas running through the Milky Way, which it turns out the sun and solar system are also interacting with. So our local backyard of the Milky Way, like the local sort of solar neighborhood around the sun is really where the foundations of a lot of astrophysical knowledge are founded. So everything from, you know, how planets form around stars from observing our own solar system to, you know, how stars form from these giant big nebula of gas like the Orion Nebula to, to supernova which produce more nebula which stars then form from and planets form from as well but then also you know the movement of the Milky Way itself how stars clump together on spiral arms and then all move around the center of the Milky Way together and underpinning all of those things all of those processes I've just described is gas. Was I talking to her about gas? <laughs> Gas is what makes up those huge giant clouds of nebula. It's what stars form from. It's what stars give out when they die. It's also what binds all the stars together and makes the spiral structure that we're so familiar with seeing in other galaxies and also now know that our Milky Way also has that structure as well. So in order to understand what we see around us, we need to understand gas. Now the problem is gas isn't a solid kind of is in the name, it's a bit of a clue. But it also means that gas is very difficult to observe because, well, it, it's gas, there's gas around us all right now, right, in the air and we can't see it. And so it means it's very difficult to determine not only the absolute size of a cloud of gas because like where actually is the edge of it, as, but, you know, when it's illuminated and it's got dust in it, you can kind of see it from the light from the surrounding stars, but it could be going much further than that and we, we might not know. But then also like the distance to these clouds as well, because, you know, a solid object is all moving together. So all of the light from a single object is either blue shifted or red shifted, either the wave length of the light is squashed or it is stretched by the fact that the whole thing is moving the same way that the sound wave from a siren going past you from a police car or an ambulance fire engine whatever it might be is squashed as it comes towards you and stretched as it goes away from you and, and that's when you hear the, the different sort of change in pitch as the siren screams towards and away from you. In a gaseous object though all the molecules are just moving however they want to move. They're all moving in different directions. The idea of a gaseous object is that the temperature of the object means that the molecules are moving much faster, the hotter the gas is. And so they're also all moving in random directions as well. So you don't get a single sort of redshift from that object. So that's very difficult to determine the distance to it, how we would usually also, because they're not really sort of single objects, we can't use the tricks that we do to determine distances to stars like parallax. So this is the idea of like perspective of whatever angle you're observing the star at. Are you observing it like in June from one angle or are you observing it in December when the Earth has gone all the way around the sun? You're observing it from a different angle and have you seen its position shift because of your perspective? Because it's not all one single solid object that you can point at and be like, that is the cloud of gas in that specific part of the sky. It's, it's very difficult to do it that way as well. And so in the past, because we've not been sure of the size of these things and the distance of these things, we haven't really been sure how they all relate to each other and crucially how they all interconnect. So the accuracy of the distance we had to the big clouds that permeate all of this interstellar space in the Milky Way was actually about as accurate as the size of the cloud themselves, which, you know, for astronomy's terms, that's probably an order of magnitude at least, but it's not great if you wanna actually look at the detailed structure of the Milky Way, at least in our own solar neighborhood where we have a chance of doing this. 
So the way we've done this before is we've used the dust that hangs out in these gas clouds as well to try and determine how much the stars behind it compared to the stars in front of it, which aren't affected by the dust, are reddened by absorption. So it absorbs a lot of the blue light and you end up only really getting red light through because it's longer wavelengths, so it can kind of go like around all of the dust particles. And then you can kind of make a, a sort of model of what's going on and which stars are getting reddened in what area and so how much of a cloud would you expect to be there and, and at what distance based on the distance of the stars that you know are getting reddened and not getting reddened. So based on all of that prior knowledge, our previous view for what the, our solar neighborhood looked like was what was called Gould's Belt. So literally like an arc or a ring of gas clouds that connected sort of the sun with the surrounding regions like Orion Nebula, things like that in a big arc because you saw it sort of as an arc on the sky and therefore if you think about how they're then sort of projected into 3D from like the 2D of what you see in the sky based on the rough distances we did have it was sort of making an arc kind of shape so it was called Gould's Belt. But a recent mission called the Gaia mission which has been launched by ESA the European Space Agency is changing all of that. So what Gaia is doing is getting very accurate positions for a billion stars in the Milky Way. And it's doing that by getting really accurate parallaxes, this perspective change on them. And what it's measuring is not just the sort of X, Y, Z position of the stars, but it's also measuring the velocity in the X, Y, and Z directions as well. So we can get a really detailed, not just map, but also how the Milky Way is also moving. Now combine that with much more detailed statistical modeling of what is going on in these clouds in terms of the reddening of the stars behind it, which you now know the positions much more accurately for as well. And then also some really interesting statistical inference. What you would get is much more accurate positions of these clouds in comparison to the stars as well. And so this is exactly what happened last year. In July 2019, Catherine Zucker and collaborators produced this wonderful resource that was open for anybody to use of super accurate distances to the nearest, what we call giant molecular clouds of gas in our local Milky Way. And it was essentially this huge, big, giant, long table of all of the positions and sizes of our sort of local neighborhood gas clouds. And the uncertainties have been drilled down so that they now are like 5% of the size of the cloud rather than the entire size of the cloud. And so this was unprecedented, the level of detail we now had in terms of where these clouds were and what size they were. That was great, but big long tables are not exactly great for the human brain. It's not something that we can process easily. Plus we're dealing with astronomy here literally the science of observations and imagery that is done in 2D but really is in 3D. So what the team really wanted to do was visualize what was going on here. That's easier said than done though. To do that, you need a scientific visualization tool that allows you to actually plot something in 3D, not just take something that's 3D and look what it looks like in the XY plane, in the YZ plane, in the XZ plane. You actually need to be able to plot it in 3D and really get your hands on it and spin it around and look what it looks like from every single angle. And also look what it looks like in comparison to other data sets, to the positions of other things, to the position of where we think the spiral arm is in the Milky Way and where the sun is and where Gould's belt previously was thought to be, etc. And that tool, you can't take it for granted that that exists. It sounds like it should exist. It's 2020, you think you'd just be able to walk down to the shop and just whoosh, take a 3D Viz tool. But the thing is, that kind of tool to put in all that data is a very specialized tool. And so to do this, you have to find people who specialize in this 3D visualization of astronomical data. This, so this is what three astronomers set out to do. Catherine Zucker, who was the lead author on that paper calculating the really accurate distances. Joao Alves, who is an expert in star formation and the sort of local backyard of the Milky Way. And Alyssa Goodman, who'd done work with Joao Alves before because she was also really interested in our sort of stellar backyard and interstellar space, but also had been working with people to develop these visualization tools for a long time. And specifically one called Glue. And so by working together, what they were able to do is actually work on seeing what the structure of these gas clouds looked like for the first time. What they found was unprecedented. It wasn't a ring or an arc like what Gold's Belt had predicted. It was a wave. 
an actual 3D wave spanning about 9,000 light years and going sort of up and down out of the flat disk of the Milky Way by about 500 light years running right next to the sun as well. And it was amazing how well a mathematical sine wave actually fit this data as well. It wasn't like it was sort of a random wave. It was really a beautiful, what we call a damped sine wave. So Catherine Zucker, Joao Alves and Alyssa Goodman all worked together with a couple of other collaborators to be able to publish this result in Nature this week, the first issue of 2020, announced with the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting as well. And what I love about this discovery is that, yes, okay, it was the culmination of many years of work, but it also was one of those science eureka moments that you, you don't really hear about that often. And so uh, because these three are also my collaborators, I sat down on video chat with them on a Zoom meeting in order to be able to have them tell you their story themselves. So I sat down with Joao, who's in Europe, and uh, Alyssa and Catherine, who are in America, for a group chat one day, and this is them telling me the exact moment when they figured out that what they found was unprecedented. So it all started when I moved for a year on this wonderful program, which is the Radcliffe program, and to work on data from Gaia, the satellite. And I don't think back then we knew what we were getting into. We had an idea, which was to explore the local neighborhood and, um, in October was a month I was there. I was, this is, I have to start. This, this is mostly about how collaboration works and how wonderful people can make wonderful things together, actually. And once you go to a talk in October, uh, this was October last year. And I remember being in a flight and no talk and I have to present the talk the, day, the next day in Paris. And I remember thinking of these images that the group of Fickbeiner at this movie that was stuck in my head where I played back and forth, back and forth. There was a hint of a connection between two um, molecular clouds, giant molecular clouds. And that's kind of like, if I have to put a seed to the, to the project, it's exactly that movie where it kind of led us to say, well, is that connected? It's not connected. So this was Paris in October. Back then we start calling it the ramp because it was a cloud that was below the plane, another cloud on the plane. It looks in the middle, maybe there's a ramp for whatever reason uh, of gas going from the plane to, in this case, Orion. That's how it started. And uh, it was kind of interesting, the first reaction of when we gave the talk that no one really believed it. By the way, I did not think this ramp idea was real. I thought it was just this wow, like grandiose ideas of these connecting between clouds. So uh, I was actually the first skeptic of this. Which is great, which is great. Because you, you were also the first one who actually did the hard work of connecting the dots in, with the data. And that made all the difference because once, once Catherine did this, it was in Paris. For me, uh, at, by the end of the meeting, I thought there is clearly something. I probably. No one did, but I was pretty convinced there was something. All right. Well, it's because she was the big skeptic. Yeah. And, uh, and so she kept trying to fill in the pieces. And eventually she found <laughs> something called Big Linky. We'll let her explain. Yeah. And oh, so yeah. the first part that Joao was talking about this ramp, that ended up being something like only 120th or 115th of the entire wave. But he could see the whole thing. He could see the whole thing, or he could see at least a half of it uh, from the beginning. And so what first thing that we did was we tried to connect these two clouds that Joao thought was in this ramp. And so what we did is we not only mapped out all these major star forming regions, we mapped out all the structure in between them, which had never really been studied before. In 3D. In 3D ever. And so wow. what we did is we actually took these two connecting ramp clouds and we filled in all of the material in between and it essentially fit perfectly in 3D to it was it was entirely insane. I was writing outside Joao's office and I was like, Joao, I cannot believe you're right, but this is this is not something big. And that was only like, even even when Catherine did that, you know, it was, what was that? Like a quarter, a third of what we was, have now? It was like less than a tenth. Less than a tenth. Okay. So it was wow. just a long linear structure. And so I kept keeping track of what they were doing and I kept getting these little news flashes. And, and then one day, Joao calls me 
and it was, I think, a Friday evening, and we both had had social plans canceled, or families were out with other people, and he says, he says, uh, he was at Radcliffe, which is like three quarters of a mile from my office here, and he called me, and he says, um, are you busy? And I said, uh, no, why? He said, I gotta show you something. I said, okay, <laughs> my office, and so so we, we decided to order some Indian food and get some dinner uh, in my office because like both of us don't get that much chance to actually just sit around and do science. And so, great. and um, we call up Catherine because like this isn't fair and she lives around the corner. And so we call Catherine and we say like, oh, get any Indian food, you want to come over? She's like, yeah, yeah. So we, we're all sitting here at, at this very table. We, we put what Joao wanted to show me, which was a bit more of this uh, series of clouds in 3D. Uh, all together in, in this software that we used a lot uh, called Glue to, to organize data and to see it in 3D. And, and then uh, Joao or Catherine, I can't remember, says, oh yeah, like I wish we could just see this in, in a cartoon of the galaxy because clearly this is some long 3D object and it's, it's straight from the top and it's bent from the side. Even though I'm involved with both of these software projects, I had forgotten that you could open data in Worldwide Telescope, which is this program that can contextualize astronomy data in terms of all other astronomy data um, inside of GLUE. So we just drag the data onto the, the canvas of GLUE and we select Worldwide Telescope and, and all of us just go, what? Okay, <laughs> because the data fit exactly in the cartoon model that Robert Hurt and other experts about the Milky Way had made and they had put this kind of dark, very straight lane that didn't look exactly like a spiral, exactly where this Radcliffe wave wow. winds up being. And it was just super weird. Um, and, and we thought, oh my God. And so we were already like kind of drooling Indian food back in, in the winter, you know, when we only saw a part of it. Um, but then what happened was, I guess I, uh, Catherine and Joao were fully convinced. And I was convinced, but I wasn't convinced that we had enough for the paper um, to say, well, we didn't just cherry pick this nice straight line, of it, right? And so then Catherine took it upon herself um, to find the distance to every known molecular cloud, you know, within, what was it, two kiloparsecs within of 2. the sun or something. kiloparsecs, yeah. yeah. But uh, imagine, right, that you just took everything that's now in this wave structure that you can see in the video and just scrambled it, like, with an uncertainty of 30 or 40 mm. There's no way that you yeah. would be able to see that. And so it's really these really sophisticated statistical techniques that Doug Finkbeiner's group have been working on for a decade, uh, you know, Catherine's work to actually refine those and then the idea of adding in Gaia, which of course is very useful because it's constrained mm -hmm. independently from the colors of stars, which is what we did before. Um, uh, anyway, and so it's sort of like, like Shuao said, it's all about collaboration and like everything came together uh, mm -hmm. right at this moment. And now it's just too easy. To, to sort of see the three D structure of these things, and so you know, now we want to look at more of the galaxy. And I mean, uh, that's what I really, really enjoyed about this part of this collaboration was was you know bouncing ideas, having uh, Indian food, and, <laughs> and and coming up with crazy you know scenarios for the whole thing. Just hearing that story gives me goose pimples like what they they turned what was thought to be an arc into this long straight thing that undulates containing something like three million times the mass of the sun in gas that connects all of those stars in our region of the milky way it's hard to wrap your head around and no one can really explain why this even exists yet like what actually caused this wave? Is it sort of like a, a ripple on the surface of a pond? Did a globular cluster, like a big cluster of stars, or did a sort of dwarf galaxy that was orbiting the Milky Way crash through the Milky Way's disk? And did the ripples from that encounter sort of spread out through the gas? And, and that's what's given us this shape. No one really knows yet. It could be something else entirely. It could be a supernova in the disk of the Milky Way that was incredibly powerful. Maybe it was the merging of two black holes and Perhaps the shock waves from that have caused this wave. We're not entirely sure. Like people are thinking of various different ideas all the time. And what I love is that because this is something that hasn't ever really been considered by observers or theorists or people who simulate galaxies in the universe as a whole either before, they're going to get everybody together. There's literally going to be this 
wave con in the summer of this year where they get everyone who's an expert in star formation and gas and the Milky Way and kinematics and dynamics of how things move in space together, whether they are an observer who used telescopes, or whether they're a theorist who stuns at the blackboard, or whether they're a simulations person who uses computers to figure out what's going on, they're going to literally lock everyone in a room for a week to try and figure out what's going on. And I am just like, I volunteer as tribute! Because that is like an astrophysical who done it and I want to be there. Obviously when you get something like this published it is amazing but always the next question is what comes next? What's in the future for this kind of work? And so I asked the team that when I chatted to them as well. Attention right now of course we want to do a lot of things about you know it's a wave is it oscillating and how does it oscillate and all that. Why yeah. does it be oscillating? But there's one thing that I think is very interesting is that we just crossed it 13 million years ago, the sun. We just, it's actually, we, we're coming from Orion uh, 13 million years ago, solar system crossed this minefield, which was the, all the massive star formation in Orion. So all the blouse groups, you can also see, see them naked eye actually. And that must be kind of something. It must have left some mark on the planet. And this aspect of, you know, we are related to the, to the Radcliffe wave. It's not just something far away. You know, it's probably something that you can find when, when your mass spectrometers get better and better, as they are getting better and better. You find this iron 60 everywhere on, on the surface of the planet that can only come from supernovae. So it's not, it, that aspect for me is fascinating. It's not something that it's over there and we're here. No, it's kind of part of us. Why? Because then we're going to cross it again because of the way you know, orbiters work in the galaxy, we have this intertwinement. We'll be, we'll be crossing the, the, well, not the wave because the gas will be gone, but all the young stars that are formed mm. in the wave will be our you know, neighbors for, for the, the next yes. couple of orbits around the Milky Way. We really have to understand where this came from. And so this conference mm -hmm. that Joao proposed and, and Catherine and I at Radcliffe, um, is to bring together all the theorists who have all kinds of ideas about what could be causing the wave. And so it's everything from, you know, stuff dropping in from outside the galaxy and causing a perturbation. There's some people who think it could be, you know, some kind of feedback, like really crazy explosions from stars. I don't think so, but you know, some people who think that, there's other people who think there could be like globs of dark matter in the disk of the Milky Way. I also don't think that, you know, I think it's probably some kind of collision. Um, but in answer to your question, um, this one is the one, like Joao said, you know, right up next to our face. And so it's the easiest one to find. And so it actually, in fact, might be easier to see little ripples in edge on disks of other galaxies when we have high Oh, cool. That, um, than to find more in our galaxy. But of course, we'll try. Um, That's my kind of area as well, right? So maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe we'll all collaborate at some point. In kind of really yeah. I love the idea that the next place we could find something like this isn't necessarily in the Milky Way, but it's in those galaxies that we can see them edge on. You know, we don't see them face on with their beautiful spiral. We see the edge of them, like sort of looking at the edge of a pit of bread kind of thing. And we might be able to see the dynamics of the gas in those before we spot it anywhere closer to us in the Milky Way. And that's the kind of thing that I do. I care about other galaxies in the universe and yes, mostly what their black holes are doing to them, but also you have to understand what's going on in the rest of the galaxy to figure out what the black hole is responsible for. So I do a lot of this sort of study of what's going on in the disk of galaxies and the plane of galaxies. And it's kind of awesome to think that something that someone was doing so removed from my work, so close to us in the Milky Way, could eventually link to what I'm doing, you know, trying to understand the galaxy's billions of light years away. So maybe I will get an invite to that meeting after all. Who knows? Fingers crossed. If I can even go, we'll see. But if I do go, then know that you will also be a fly on the wall for that meeting because there is no way that I am letting you guys miss out on the astrophysical whodunit of the decade. Is it too early to say that? I don't know. Let's go with it. The astrophysical who done it of the decade. Why didn't I sign up to go to that meeting in Hawaii? Seriously, what is wrong with me? I wonder where the next one is. Maybe I could go at that one. Oh, please be somewhere tropical. Please be somewhere tropical. <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. Nope. 
Sorry, Wisconsin. I'm sure you're very pretty, but you're not Honolulu, are you? It was the end of a decade, but the start of an age. I was screaming long live. And then you can kind of make a little bit of a model for what's going on and which stars are resined. Resined? <laughs> Why am I always ill when I'm filming? Like before Christmas, it was the pre-Christmas cold. And now it's the like post-Christmas cold that I still can't shake. And I still sound like I'm like my sticky, sticky shoes.